We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. I'm really delighted to be here and kind of kick things off by talking about the evolution of human walking and human running. And uh, so let's get going. So uh, it's important to recognize that, um, you know, all animals engage in physical activity, which we define as any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles that expends energy, but only humans exercise, which I define as discretionary physical activity, which we undertake to sustain or improve health and fitness. And of all the major kinds of exercise that we do, and on the major kinds of physical activity that we do, nothing is more common than walking and running. But as to understand that, we really need to step back a little bit. It's important if we think about both physical activity and exercise, which, which of course is a kind of physical activity, it's important to back up and think about that in the context of what animals do all day long, and that involves also physical inactivity. And humans, it must be understood, evolved from relatively inactive creatures. And a, and a simple way of thinking about that is something called the physical activity level, or the PAL. The PAL is just the ratio of the total energy expended in a day, your total energy expenditure, divided by your basal metabolic rate. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about this from, from Herman Ponzer. But most animals have PALs of about two to three. In other words, they're about two to three times more active than they are sort of just kind of spent the energy they spend sort of sitting around. But but apes are basically couch potatoes. Um, so orangs, gorillas, chimpanzees, they have pals of about 1.4 or 1.5. Um, and that's a huge reduction um, compared to, to most animals. And, um, and like one way of thinking about that is just even your average sedentary American uh, spends way more energy just per, per calorie per kilo than, than wild chimpanzees on being active. So selection for, for the, but what happened in human evolution was that there was selection for increased physical activity. So remember, pals of, of apes are about 1.4, 1.5. Pals for hunter-gatherers are around two. And so that represents a really substantial increase. And that's because hunter-gatherers in, engage in, in digging and carrying and throwing and dancing and climbing and fighting and all kinds of stuff, but especially they engage in walking and running. So if you look at the average amount of walking uh, distance per day that uh, that chimpanzees do, it's about two to four kilometers in most in most groups in most most times. Whereas your average female hunter gatherer in the in the tropics walks about eight to nine kilometers a day, and the average male hunter gatherer walks about twelve to fifteen kilometers a day. Another way of putting that is that your average female hunter gatherer walks from L.A. to D.C. every day, uh, uh, every year, excuse me, uh, throughout her life. So walking and running are really the most fundamental forms of both moderate and vigorous physical activity that we humans have been undertaking for millions of years. And as, just to understand that, we, we often define moderate and vigorous physical activity based on what's called your MET, your metabolic rate, which is just the ratio of how much energy you're spending to how much energy you'd be spending at rest. So moderate physical activities are usually about three to six times more, more sort of energetically costly than resting. So, so a brisk walk, for example, would be moderate physical activity. And vigorous, vigorous physical activities are greater than six mets, or six times the energy you spend in walking. And of course, running is, is, of course, the most fundamental form of vigorous physical activity. So it's not uh, an insight. Everybody here probably already knows that, that bipedalism is, of course, one of the major things that happened in human evolution. And in fact, it was bipedal walking, not big brains, that really led the way in human evolution, that got us started on a separate evolutionary path um, than, than our ape ancestors. So we evolved from, 
from a, from a last common ancestor with chimpanzees, and both chimpanzees and gorillas are knuckle walkers. So by the principle of parsimony, it looks, it, you know, it's reasonable to hypothesize that the last common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees was probably a knuckle walker, although that's still debated. And at some point, probably very soon after that, 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 um, that, that last common ancestor, we became bipeds. And we have a lot of evidence for that, actually, um, despite a very poor fossil record. So this is, uh, this is the skull of Sahelanthropus, also sometimes known as Tumai. It's about 7 million years old from Chad. And although there's a, like a really bad femur from this, from this, uh, from this guy, we, we do have the full skull. And this skull was unquestionably that of a biped because its foramen magnum pointed downwards. And of course, animals uh, look where they're going when they're walking. And so a downwardly pointed frame and magnum is telltale evidence of some kind of bipedal gait. We also have a femur from a, from a, from a species called Auroran from Kenya from around 6 million years ago. And of course, there's the, the famous RD skeleton, which has a reasonably complete pelvis. And that pelvis is unquestionably the pelvis of a biped. So there are, of course, lots of debates about why early hominins started walking. But I think the very best explanations have to do with climate change. And we know this is a graph of tree cover density over, over both West and East Africa over the time period when, when early hominins evolved. And we know that between about seven and six million years ago, there was a, a brief phase of, of intense aridity uh, that, that swept across Africa. And of course, that would have had been very important for a kind of ape uh, ancestor of ours because apes live in forests. They, they subsist on, on fruits. And as, 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 as aridity increased, the distance that, they would, that apes would have had to travel in order to get to patches of food would have increased. And it turns out that knuckle walking is really very expensive. And, and bipedalism is about, about twice as efficient per kilo, per, per unit distance, um, as knuckle walking. So a, a chimpanzee uh, walking uh, four kilometers a day uh, spends about 100 kilos, whereas uh, a, a bipedal hominin waking the same amount would spend about 100 calories to walk about eight kilometers. So, so that would have been a, a substantial energetic savings um, by becoming bipedal. And bipedalism, of course, is a, is a, seems like a reasonably complicated uh, a, a gait, and it's not something that most animals do, but we know that there are a number of key adaptations that underlie our ability to be good bipedal walkers. I already mentioned that the downward-oriented frame and magnum, but there's some other key ones as well. For example, a long curved lumbar spine, uh, hips, the, the ilia of the hips that face to the side, a wide sacrum, an enlarged femoral head, reinforced knees, and a transverse arch, so an arch that goes from side to side of the foot uh, that helps uh, stiffen the foot when we, when we push off during locomotion. But that, so we know that these early hominins were, were bipedal, but there's still a lot of debates about just what, what early hominin walking was like. And there's a, been a substantial debate about whether or not they were sort of bent hip, bent knee, and walking a bit like Groucho Marx, or whether they walked like your typical human today with an extended posture. And a common way we do that is to is to do what's called functional morphology. So we'll look at a at a region of the of the of the skeleton, like a foot, for example, and we'll ask: Is that foot more chimp-like or is it more human-like? And if it's more chimp-like, we'll often assume that that means it probably had an inefficient bent hip, bent knee gait. And if it's more human-like, we'll make the inference that it had an efficient extended hip and knee gait, like a like a typical modern human. I actually think that's a very poor way of doing science because it's just correlational. It's not, it's not really testing mechanisms. And a better approach is to, is to test the effects of variations in anatomy on performance. And I don't have time to go through, through too many examples, but let's, let's give you one example here, which is, for example, long toes. So it's often argued that the long toes of Australopiths and, and perhaps Artipithecus as well would have compromised its ability to walk. But that's actually a testable hypothesis. The reason is that you know, long toes uh, create a moment, a torque, a rotational moment around the joint between the metatarsals and the phalanges. That's the product of the force of the ground times the, the moment arm of that force. And that has to be uh, countered by, by the flexor force that's produced by the muscles times its very, very tiny moment arm, because the muscles run right close to the joint. So Campbell Rowlian, uh, who was in my lab, did a wonderful experiment where he looked at people with longer and shorter toes and measured just what that flexor force was to stabilize the joint for people who had longer versus shorter toes, and then extended that graft up to what an astralopith would be like. And basically, what Campbell found was that um, that in terms of walking, having astralopith-like toes would not have been a problem, but in terms of running, it would have been a serious problem because the amount of force that these that these digital flexors would have to produce was much greater than even the flexors that flex the big toe. And so that seems uh, almost completely improbable. And so what we think is that the long toes of Australopithecus afarensis wouldn't have really affected its walking performance, but it certainly would have affected its running performance. Another example is the longitudinal arch. So it's well known that humans have arches and that other animals don't have arches like chimpanzees. And it's often been argued that the longitudinal arch is a key adaptation for walking. 
And we should be a little bit suspicious about that because, of course, there are a lot of human beings around today. Probably about a third of the people uh, watching this conference uh, don't actually have a full arch in their foot. They can walk around. And it turns out that uh, chimpanzees also walk and they create stiffness, but not through their arch, but they create stiffness by using muscles because muscles can stiffen the midfoot. And Nikolauka, also a former member of the lab, did this, uh, did this kind of research and we did some further experiments. But uh, yes, it's true that the longitudinal arch makes the, the arch of the foot, uh, the midfoot, much stiffer in humans than chimpanzees, about four times more stiff. But the muscles of chimpanzees can still stiffen their feet about eight times more than, say, macaques can do it. So, so you don't actually need a longitudinal arch to stiffen the midfoot for, for propulsion. And so I don't think we should say the absence of a longitudinal arch in early Australopithecines meant that they couldn't walk like you or I. So a better way of doing it is to just basically t tally up all these different adaptations, the lordosis, the ilia, the angle, etc., and look at the earliest hominins and look in Australopiths and ask what's their effect on walking performance. And I think when we look at the earliest hominins, the answer is a lot of question marks. I think there's some evidence. They certainly had a lateral facing ilia. They certainly had a transverse arch. We have questions about a lot of other bits of anatomy, and there are other bits that they're just missing. But Australopiths certainly have quite a few features, I think, that would have made them effective uh, at walking. And I think we can't discount the fact that their, their walking abilities would have been equal to that of humans. And, and in fact, the smoking gun evidence really comes from those famous Laetoli footprints and a very neat analysis that Dave Reichland did, where they looked at the effect of different kinds of walking gaits on the footprints that people leave. And when you walk with an extended hip and knee, you basically, the, the, the heel print and the toe print are about of equal depth. But when you walk with a bent hip, bent knee, you leave a much deeper toe print. And if you look at the Laetoli prints, they look very much like a modern human with an extended hip and knee. And I think that's good evidence, you know, very convincing evidence that, that these hominins, presumably Australopithecus, uh, walked with an extended gait like you and me. And that's great because walking is cool. It frees up our hands. There's all kinds of wonderful things about walking that we think is really amazing and important and helped create all kinds of opportunities in human evolution. But let's also remember that walking has some drawbacks, right? When you walk on two feet, you're less stable. You're more likely to fall over. It's a real problem if you're a pregnant mother because you now you have this enormous weight in front of you that makes you want to tip over all the time. It puts a lot of stress on your back and, and walking may lead to increases in back pain. And of course, another really big problem with walking, which we don't talk about very often, is that it makes us slow. If you have only two legs, you can produce force, you know, and generate power with only two legs as opposed to four legs. And that makes us, by definition, about half the speed of, of similar sized quadrupeds. And, and so somebody like Usain Bolt, who's the world's fastest sprinter, he can run about 37 kilometers per hour. And that's way less fast than, you know, a typical lion that can run about 80 kilometers per hour. And of course, very few of us can run as fast as Usain Bolt. Most, you know, fit, reasonably good fit human beings can run only about 24 kilometers per hour. So we would have been, you know, easy pickings uh, for, for carnivores uh, back in the day as a result of our being bipedal. So that would have been a very, very serious problem. And so a reasonable hypothesis is that because we were slow bipedal walkers, uh, there was uh, we had to find other ways to avoid uh, being eaten by predators. And one hypothesis that uh, I put forward, and you'll hear more about it from Yana Kamberov, is that although we think about hair loss and, and the increase in sweat glands as being crucial for running, maybe it was actually really important for walking because hominids foraging out in the midday sun uh, uh, would have had an advantage because they could, they could lose heat, um, uh, dump heat uh, more effectively than carnivores uh, who, would, who could have chased them. Maybe the ability to, to forage in the middle of the day when it was really hot by, by sweating and having not so much fur was a really important uh, advantage for being bipedal. Uh, time will tell as we test just when we lost our hair and when we increased our sweat glands. Now let's um, let's let's switch now to the other gate, which is running. And you know, for many years, in fact, when I was a student, we pretty much discounted running as being an important gate in human evolution. You know, even the fastest human beings are slow compared to most animals. And so, you know, a typical human being can run a little bit faster than a skunk, but would be you know in a close heat with a hippo or a rhino, and that's not not very impressive, right? But things changed, started to change because of, first of all, two pioneer papers published in 1984, one by Dave Carrier, who, who you're going to hear from a little later on, but also another one by Walter Bortz from Stanford Medical School, uh, making the claim that, that running was really important in human evolution. And, and Dennis Bramble and I sort of picked up on this and expanded the argument in our paper in 2004 in Nature, where we argued that, that endurance running played a really important in the role in the evolution of the genus Homo. And to understand the importance of running, it's, you need to understand that running is not just fast walking. So when you walk, you're using your legs basically like a stilt, like a, like, like a pendulum. And during the first half of stance, you raise your body center of mass that stores up, up kinetic energy. 
uh, potential energy, excuse me. And then during the second half of stance, your center mass falls and you get that kinetic energy back, that potential energy back for free as, as, as potential energy back for free as, as kinetic energy. So you're kind of storing and releasing kinetic and potential energy. But running, you use your legs like a spring. It's like a pogo stick, right? And running, when you hit the ground, instead of your center of body, center of mass going up, it actually goes down. And you flex your hips and your knees and your ankles and you're stretching elastic elements in your legs, those tendons, and they store up energy like a spring and then they help push your body back up into the air for the aerial phase that occurs in a run that doesn't occur in a walk. So running is biomechanically really profoundly different uh, from walking. And humans are really good at running because running is basically jumping from one leg to another and we are amazing jumpers. To prove that to you, here's a graph of speed against uh, uh, speed uh, for, uh, uh, for different species. So humans, dogs, ponies, and horses. And it's important to recognize that trotting is the endurance gate for quadrupeds. And human beings, even sort of, this is the human endurance running range. And even, you know, average middle-aged professors like me can run above the trot gallop transition speed of a full-size dog, my size, and as well as a pony. And good human runners can run above the trot gallop uh, transition speed of horses. And that's not discounting, that's not even taking into consideration the thermoregulatory abilities of humans. That's just the speed at which humans can run long distances like marathons. Humans are also capable of running extraordinarily long distances. So like, you know, millions of people every year run marathons. And yet most animals, including the social carnivores like hyenas and animals like horses, which have been bred for running, they can't and don't run for very long uh, distances. They run about, you know, 15 to 20 kilometers. And of course, we're apes, right? And other apes barely run at all. So chimpanzees will run maybe about 100 meters. That's pretty much uh, the, the, the maximum. And finally, in terms of economy, humans are fantastic. This is a graph of, of body mass against the cost of running. Um, and you can see as bigger animals are more efficient, but humans run, land right, right, pretty much right along the lines. And we're about as efficient as, as horses and as, as, as ostriches and, and various antelopes. We're, we're really very efficient runners, at, uh, as, uh, not, not what I was told by my professor back in the day. And, and, to put, and to prove it, I actually, a few years ago, ran one of those races where you can run against horses, uh, run, a, run a marathon against horses. And even though I'm a kind of an average runner, an average marathoner, I actually beat um, uh, most of the horses in that race. So that was kind of cool. So I was able to put my money uh, where my mouth is. And the reason I was able to do that, and the reason that you know, average everyday humans can, can, can have these extraordinary running abilities is that there's a, an enormous number of adaptations that have been identified that, ena that enable humans to be really good runners. And, I, and, and that's evidence for considerable selection. And so there's a wide range of these. A lot of these, of course, are musculoskeletal, but there's also cardiovascular and respiratory mechanisms. There are digestive ones and thermoregulatory ones and metabolic ones as well. But let me just very briefly uh, touch on, on some, some of these other adaptations. So, so my lab has spent a lot of time studying musculoskeletal adaptations for running and short toes, for example, that's one of them. An enlarged gluteus maximus is also known. You're all probably all sitting on it, but humans have an enlarged gluteus maximus, and it turns out this muscle plays very little role in walking, but it's really important for stabilizing the trunk in running, and we can show that humans, in fact, in, once with the genus Homo, there's been an extraordinary increase in the size of this muscle, especially the cranial portion, which is a, which is a trunk stabilizer. Humans also have the, an IT band, a source of a lot of injury, but the IT band is convergently involved with animals like goats and, and sheep, and, and, uh, and Carolyn Ang in my lab showed that IT bands are also an important adaptation because they, they're an elastic storage device that stores up energy during stance and helps passively uh, swing the leg uh, during the swing phase um, and saving actually a considerable amount of energy. We also have all the, remember running is, is basically jumping from one leg to the other and we have all these tendons that are really important storage organs for elastic energy. So chimpas and gorillas, for example, have tiny little tendons. That's the length of a of Achilles tendon in a gorilla, but in humans, it's more than half the length of the shank. And we have all these other tendons in the IT band. Again, these are important elastic energy storage devices. And we also have elastic energy storage devices in our feet. So some people think about the longitudinal arch as being a key adaptation for walking, but I actually think it's really more an adaptation for running. Again, you can walk without a longitudinal arch, but it's really hard to run without one. And that, and that, that plantar fascia and those tendons in the foot turns out save a fair amount of energy that we, we cover with each step. And then finally, just want to mention the nuchal ligament, because we just published a paper, Andrew Yagian in my lab is the first author, where we showed that the arm acts as a counterbalance to the head via this fantastic little elastic organ, this elastic tendon in the back of the, of the, of the neck called the, the nuchal ligament, which helps link the, the mass of the arm with the mass of the head, thereby providing a passive form of stabilization of the head for when we're running. But there's a lot more adaptations than just, than just musculoskeletal. Let me just mention some key cardiovascular adaptations, because of course, when you run, you need to 
you need to do any or any other kind of sustained physical activity, you need a high cardiac output. You know, it's the, the amount of uh, you know, uh, blood that you can uh, circulate throughout your body. And 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 humans do that in part because we have very different hearts from chimpanzees. We have uh, ventricles, that's the main pumping chamber of the heart, the left ventricle, which pumps blood throughout the body, in humans is larger, and it's thinner, and it's less trabeculated, and importantly, it also has the ability to, to twist and untwist like a spring during running. So this is a graph with, done with a collaboration with my, my colleagues and friends, Aaron Bagish and Rob Shave, but this is a chimpanzee in red, and these are different kinds of humans. This is a runner, and this is a football player in blue and green, but during systole, which is the pumping phase, the human heart twists, and then during diastole, which is the filling phase, uh, it then untwists. Whereas uh, the chimpanzee, basically, the heart is unable to twist and untwist, uh, and thereby uh, loses that elastic uh, capability. So humans, uh, like human runners, can have way larger cardiac outputs uh, when standardized, so the liters per minute standardized by body mass, than uh, chimpanzees and gorillas, and even humans that don't have really big uh, endurance-adapted hearts, like football linemen, still have way more ability to produce high cardiac outputs uh, per unit body mass uh, than chimpanzees and gorillas. So those are important adaptations for vigorous physical activity. We also have key adaptations for, for, for respiration. So, you know, if you're going to get on all that, um, all that high cardiac output, that's basically to, to pump oxygen around your body, right? And so you need to also breathe in a lot more oxygen. And humans um, have ability to expand our thoraxes more than, than most other animals to enable us to, to, to have the really high uh, tidal volumes or the really high ventilatory volumes that, um, that enable us to suck in a lot of oxygen and then use it around our bodies. So, um, and that partly comes from, from the ability to have not just a big thorax, but also a very mobile thorax. So if you look at basically breathing here on the, on the x-axis against the, the, the medial lateral expansion of the thorax on the y-axis here in this lower graph, and this is the dorsoventral or, or front-to-back expansion of the thorax on the y-axis, we call this the bucket handle movement. We call this the pump handle movement. As you can see, uh, dogs are capable of a little bit of a pump handle movement, um, uh, like humans. Goats are not capable of it. But dogs are incapable because they're quadrupeds. Their limbs are constraining the medial lateral movement of the thorax, just like in goats. But humans have this amazing ability to also increase medial lateral movement. And the end result is that we have really high ability to breathe in a huge amount of oxygen. And, that, and those rib movements are made possible by joints between the ribs and the, and the vertebra, which are much more concavo convex in the genus Homo than they are in chimpanzees as well in Australopiths. So, so that ability to have all that movement um, evolved in the genus Homo. And that work, by the way, I should mention, was done by Eamon Callison in my lab. Really cool stuff. Okay, so, uh, so why is all this uh, going on? Well, the answer is, um, is, is, for, is to get meat, right? And so we think the importance for running uh, is both for scavenging as well as persistence hunting. So for scavenging, like you see all those animals, you see a bunch of vultures in the distance, you know there's some meat there and you want to get there before the hyenas. Well, you have an advantage in the middle of the day. You can get there before the hyenas do and, and have access to the meat before the hyenas have, have, have devoured whatever the lions have left over. Another important, uh, an, another important um, uh, 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 behavior is what we call persistence hunting, which you can see from this video. So what happens is that hunters in the middle of the day will pick an animal, a big animal, and they'll chase it, they'll track it, and they'll chase it, and they'll track it. It's a combination of walking and running. And eventually that animal, as you can see, this is a kudu, this is a, a san hunter, uh, that kudu uh, will, uh, will, will collapse from, from, from heat stroke. And running is important for a wide range of other kinds of hunting behaviors, like chasing animals over cliffs or chasing them into, into traps. Or even in, uh, in, 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 in the snow, uh, we have evidence of, of Native Americans who are hunting caribou, for example, in, um, and, and in the snow. And the snow re apparently really tires those caribou out. And so if you have skis or some other ability to run on snow, uh, you have the ability to, 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 to do persistence hunting even in cold environments. And wherever we look in the ethnographic record, we find uh, evidence for this kind of hunting. And it always involves running. And I also want to dispel the, the myth that running is just for men. When we look in the ethnographic record, we, wherever we look, if you start looking, you find evidence that women also do it too. So for example, among the San, uh, Nisa, for example, uh, in her autobiography, as, as told to Marjorie Shostak, she describes actually several events in the book where she ran down animals or ran to, to scavenge. So, and, and, and there's also evidence, for example, from the Agta uh, hunter-gatherers in the Philippines, where, where men tend to use like lots of big weapons, but women, women often run down deer or, or, or pigs uh, in, in, among the Agta. Um, and so it's uh, this is and it's true also in, in Australia and elsewhere. So let's not let's not um, let's not uh, think that running is only for men. Women are just as good at running as men. And finally, 
you know, an evolutionary approach helps us understand how and why we evolved to walk and run, but it's also important to remember that walking and running still matter, right? Uh, because we live in a world in which we've now created all these machines that do all our work for us, and, and we now walk less. And, and uh, one way of measuring that is looking at steps per day. So typical Americans take about 4,700 steps per day, and that's based on really large samples of, of people from you, people's cell phones and stuff like that, or from pedometers. But, but for example, hunter-gatherers like the Hadza take about 16,000 steps a day. The Taramar we've measured take about 19,000 steps a day. So there's been an incredible decrease in just average daily number of steps per day. Um, and, and that, of course, has negative effects. This is a very important graph. This is the uh, this is a, a data set from well over a million Americans that, sh that, that plots minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity, so like walking or running, for example, against the age-adjusted relative risk of death. And you can see that just a, an hour a, a week of, of, of moderate to vigorous physical activity can lower your, your, your age-adjusted risk of death by about 40%. And if you get down to the World, Rec World Health Organization recommended minimum, which is 150 minutes a week, you actually get a 50% reduction in your relative risk of death. And if you go all the way to the pre-industrial levels that we see, say, among the Hadza or the Taramara, you get down to almost a 70% reduction in your relative risk of death. So we are suffering really quite seriously from the fact that about only about 20% of Americans actually meet that World Health Organization recommended minimum of 150 minutes a week. Another thing that's different, of course, is that we also walk and run weirdly. Like back in the day when we walked, we, we were either barefoot or we wore very minimal shoes. And now we wear all these fancy schmancy shoes that are comfortable or sexy or whatever. And they have all kinds of cushioning. Back in the day, we used to, you know, people used to uh, carry stuff when they walked. They'd carry water, they'd carry firewood, they'd carry food, they'd carry their babies. And now we carry almost nothing, maybe sometimes a little bit of a backpack, and that's about it. So walking has changed in, in all kinds of fundamental ways. And running has also changed, right? Uh, people used to run barefoot or in minimal shoes, but now the majority of people in Western countries like the United States wear and run in these very cushioned shoes. And of course, that changes our how we run our kinematics. So, so people who wear cushioned shoes are very often land really hard on their heels and they overstride, whereas people who are barefoot are forced to run what I call a barefoot style, which involves uh, less overstriding and more of a flat foot when they land, more, more often a forefoot strike. People like uh, in the, who ran in the past, uh, you know, hunter-gatherers, they didn't run every day and they weren't training for marathons. They didn't run very fast. You know, they tend to run like 10 minute miles and they would run only occasionally. And they were doing like, doing like, you know, huge distances every week. Whereas people like me who are training for marathons are, are running five or six days a week and we're doing, you know, 50, 60 miles a week and we're often doing it really fast. And, and whereas people used to run on, on trails today, of course, a lot of us run on streets. And so all of that leads to much higher rates of injury. And so fundamentally, walking and running are, are, are the most, well, fundamental physical activities that we evolved to do. And, and it's important to remember that it's a mismatch when we don't do them, right? Where our bodies are not well adapted for, for a lack of, of, of regular physical activity, and that most basically includes walking and running. And there are many, many examples. I already showed you the data for the sort of relative rate of, of curve, but since we're now confronting an epidemic of COVID, let me show you some data that just came out last week, um, which is uh, from, from California, from Bob Salas, uh, using the data from the Kaiser Permanente system, but they looked at the, everybody in the Kaiser system who, for which they've got data on on physical activity, because that's a it's actually a vital sign now in the Kaiser system. So they have a huge amount of data. They looked at over forty eight thousand adults and individuals in California, who were uh, who did not get that minimum one hundred and fifty minutes a week that's recommended by the World Health Organization, compared to individuals who got one hundred and fifty weeks or minutes or more. And this is after adjusting adjusting for age and sex and what they called race and obesity and smoking and heart disease and diabetes and, and, and et cetera, the individuals who are inactive had 2.5 times greater uh, likelihood of dying from COVID, and they had a 1.7 times greater likelihood of ending up in the ICU. So, and, and there are a lot of reasons behind that, um, and, and, but most fundamental it's because our bodies are adapted for physical activity, for walking and running, and we are poorly adapted uh, for, for, for maintaining our health and getting old and staying healthy uh, in their absence. So I'd like to thank a whole bunch of folks who've helped me with all, all, you know, been part of all this journey in terms of all the research that we've done on walking and running, and thank uh, all the folks from CARTA, and I hope everybody keeps moving. <laughs>